on the news. New York's migrant busing crisis has slowed, but now how will they survive in New York City without work? The buses have stopped coming for now, but the migrants and their needs remain. I'm Jessica East Hope with how the church is helping them start over in New York City. While temps drop outside, how about a look back at summer in this current news special series. We show you the parishioner who's the pulse of her parish. Big news out of Baltimore this week. There's a new president leading the Catholic Church in the United States. Plus, want to get back this holiday season? The Tablet newspaper has just the thing to help you do it. The right Christmas campaign. I'm Christine Persichetti. This special edition of Currents News starts right now. Tens of thousands of migrants are currently trying to make it in New York City. Most want to work, but it could be months before they get their permits. But mercy for the migrants is coming from a church in East New York. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has the story. Children, ladies are on that side. Thousands of items of clothing fill a room at St. Michael's St. Malachy Parish. Every Tuesday and Thursday, migrants come for warm clothes and a hot meal. They're greeted by Barbara and Vanessa Garcia, a mother-daughter team who sprung into action as the migrant crisis peaked. We ask, people respond, we serve. Barbara is the church's business manager. Vanessa, the director of religious education. The two have made it their mission to give out more than food and clothes. It's not just come get your stuff and leave. It's more like come in, get to know us, and we're able to build a relationship with them. Just trying to be as human as possible and treating them with dignity and respect. There's a pause on the steady flow of buses from the border, but now these migrants are trying to start their lives over in a foreign country with nothing, unable to find legal work. None of them are looking for handouts. Many of them have asked us what they can do to earn what they've been given. Hola. More than 1,000 migrants have come through these doors. Barbara and Vanessa say they're just doing what comes naturally to them helping those in need and now picking up the slack for New York City's shelter system that's bursting at the seams. They gave up everything to come here. We should help them out. All of the clothing and food has been donated by the community. It's been a great opportunity, I believe, for the church to to make a stand and, and say, here we are and you're welcome here. And just like the migrants, Barbara and Vanessa are adjusting to the fluctuating need. I lay down at night and wonder, are we going to have enough for the next day? And somehow God provides and we do. Whatever God throws my way, we'll get it done. Vanessa says she teaches her religious education students about the corporal works of mercy. But even better, the migrants have given her the opportunity to show them. We teach them what we can, but I like to show them more than be able to just teach them what it is. So for them to see it in action is, is just amazing. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. If you or someone you know needs food or clothes, you can visit St. Michael St. Malachy on Tuesdays or Thursdays. The address is 284 Warwick Street. The parish office is open from 11 to 1. And just a note, they will not be open this Thanksgiving. While churches and organizations are helping migrants, New York City says it will spend at least $600 million this year on shelter and services. That projected number comes from the city's budget office. Shelter for a family of four with two kids attending public school could cost as high as $93,000 a year. The total cost of city services could change as the number of people arriving and staying in the city evolves. The Diocese of Brooklyn is already in the spirit of giving this holiday season. Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens are helping dress Thanksgiving tables around the diocese with a turkey giveaway. More than 1,100 families received uncooked birds at Our Lady of Sorrows Church in Queens Wednesday. The event, which is now in its seventh year, is all thanks to two generous donors who provide the turkeys in honor of their parents. And Bishop Robert Brennan will also help families in need have a happy Thanksgiving. Next Monday, he'll be at Holy Innocence Church in Brooklyn to help Catholic Charities hand out more turkeys. The church is located at 279 East 17th Street, and the event will take place from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Currents News and the tablet will have full coverage. Fun. Three reasons families race to Jackson Heights every year 
for summer camp. But there's another reason, the woman behind the camp. A religion teacher at Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Academy doesn't stop working when school lets out in June. She continues to put her faith into action by organizing the church's day camp. This is her story in my current news series, Pulse of the Parish. The focal point of any church would be the altar. But it's the backdrop of the altar at Our Lady of Fatima that really grabs your attention. 200,000 colored tiles along with some 18 karat gold make up the stunning handmade mosaic of the apparition. It is really one of the largest mosaics installed in the in parishes in America. The pastor, Father Darrell DaCosta, gave us a tour of the Jackson Heights Church, from the beautiful stained glass windows that line the sides of the church to the altar decoration showing the Blessed Mother visiting the children in 1917. Fast forward more than 100 years, now the children are visiting Our Lady of Fatima for summer camp. The squeak of the playground swings wheel of laughter during water balloon fights, the sounds of success for camp director Elizabeth Riley. Ah! We're trying to really enjoy every little moment of every little day and do something a little bit special each day. On this day, the special event was a backyard barbecue. Just one of the ideas Elizabeth cooked up when she started planning the camp back in January while teaching religion at Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Academy. And even though she keeps her lesson plans in the classroom. A lot of people do choose here because of the faith. Even non-Catholics love the idea of the faith. Elizabeth is the one who greets the parents at drop-off, oversees the counselors, and even spends some one-on-one -on -one time with the campers, albeit with frequent interruptions. Yes, she does. But she Most of the counselors are graduates of the school, and for many, this is their first job. They're learning about responsibility and communication and punctuality and I hope they're modeling those kinds of things for the kids. The kids are picking up some valuable lessons. We're learning to uh, have fun in your life and uh, we're learning like to be kind and um, yeah. And those are lessons some parents drive miles for their kids to learn. Five-year-old twins Nathaniel and Camilla's mom brings them here from Queens Village every day because of the camp's reputation and because of its director. I go on like, like what you feel, like a vibe, and she gives me a really good vibe and she makes me feel comfortable and I think that's, that, that's been a blessing. There's something about being in, a, in an area that is middle class working people. So when they're paying for something, they want a value from it. So to be able to create something where people appreciate what they're getting in return is pretty cool. And now you know Elizabeth Riley from Our Lady of Fatima and how she makes up the pulse of the parish. Elizabeth tells us 80% of the campers don't even attend Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Academy. This is Elizabeth's ninth year teaching there. Stay tuned for more Pulse of the Parish stories in the future. Meanwhile, students at more than 30 Catholic schools in the Diocese of Brooklyn are also putting their faith into action. They're organizing clothing drives to help asylum seekers who have arrived in New York City. In partnership with Catholic Charities, the students, like those you see here from Saints Joachim and Ann School in Queens Village, have been collecting donations of winter coats, warm clothes, toiletries, and baby supplies for the migrants. Over at St. Athanasius Catholic Academy in Bensonhurst, it's full steam ahead for their STEAM program. These first graders are creating kaleidoscopes as part of that program. In 2018, the school built a STEM lab adjacent to the school that included items like robots to help the students learn code, 3D printers, and iPads. No time machines in the STEM lab, but that didn't stop St. A's students from transporting back to the 1950s. To celebrate their 50th day of school, the students swapped their uniforms for leather jackets and poodle skirts. We even saw some pink ladies in the mix. 50 days of school means the holidays are right around the corner and the staff at the tablet is hard at work accepting donations and awarding money to parishes and Catholic ministries in the Diocese of Brooklyn. 
The Bright Christmas Fund's mission is to ensure a Merry Christmas for children and families in need. Recipients of the funds use the donations to run their Christmas initiatives. Readers of the tablet contributed $117,000 last year. The goal this year is to raise $125,000. The need is greater this year for families fighting inflation, but you can help. Here's how. Just make a check out to the Bright Christmas Fund and mail it to Bright Christmas LB number 2 118 P.O. Box 95,000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, zip code 19195. Or you can make your donation online at thetablet.org slash brightchristmas. If you didn't catch all of that, we'll give out the information again at the end of this newscast. There's a lot more news headed your way. If we don't speak to that, I don't think we're going to get anybody's attention. Bishop Emeritus Nicholas DiMarzio speaking out at the USCCB's fall assembly, what he thinks needs the attention of Catholics. Plus, a Queens woman is getting some attention because of the heart-wrenching letters she wrote to her dying son. Her story coming up. It's been a busy week for bishops around the country, prelates from coast to coast traveling to Baltimore to decide on major issues and events for the church in the United States. While U.S. bishops had two days of closed door meetings, Monday and Thursday, many headlines were made in their public gatherings. Here's a recap. The bishops elected a new president and vice president. They helped three American women get one step closer to sainthood. They unveiled some new plans for a pilgrimage to the Eucharistic Congress. And in this midterm election year, the bishops discussed how they can guide Catholics when they hit the polls. Welcome, brothers. Just like the rest of the country, elections seem to take center stage at the USCCB's fall general assembly. The bishops discussed how to help Catholics vote with their conscience, but they didn't make any major changes to their faithful citizenship document. All right, so Archbishop Timothy Broglio is the new president. They did, however, make changes to their leadership. The bishops elected Archbishop Timothy Broglio from the U.S. Archdiocese for the Military Services as their new president. Afterwards, Broglio said while he doesn't see his role as a political one, he does look forward to meeting with political leaders in the U.S. Uh, if there is any way to uh, insert the gospel into uh, all aspects of, of life in our country, I'll certainly, I certainly will not miss any occasion to do that. Here's an occasion you won't want to miss. The USCCB is planning a pilgrimage to the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis in July of 2024. It's the culmination of the Eucharistic Revival, launched earlier this year to raise awareness of the real presence in the communion. What is the heart of this movement, which is a movement that we seek to invite people to a transforming encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist so that they might be healed, formed, unified, and sent on mission. This is really uh, what we're all about. They were so impressed with the missions of three American women that the bishops voted to advance their causes for sainthood. We also heard from outgoing president, Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, who talked about the unity of the bishops during some tumultuous times of his tenure, the pandemic, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and a worldwide refugee crisis. We've been through a lot. And we are doing a lot. All of us in the church are being called to a deeper conversion. All of us are being called to step up and open every door for Jesus Christ, to shine his light into every area for culture and society, to bring every heart to a new encounter with the living God. Going back to the Eucharistic Congress in 2024, 80,000 Catholics are expected to attend. Registration will open next spring. The national correspondent for the Tablet and Crocs, John Lavenberg, has been reporting on the bishops all week. He broke down the big plans for the Congress and explained it's not the first time the event will be held. The first one was 1926, and so from 1926 to 1976, they had nine of them. And now they're having the 10th, and that's part of the reason why this is so big and grand, because though it's the 10th, it's, it's been 50 years. It's been a long time since they have had one in the U.S. Yeah, sure. That's why a lot of us don't remember them at all. Mm -hmm. The bishops also took a look at their voting guide for Catholics, the document Faithful Citizenship. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, emeritus of the Diocese of Brooklyn, shared his opinions. Let's listen to what he had to say. 
It's so important that we understand a new political uh, phenomenon in our own country, the division, and if we don't speak to that, I don't think we're going to get anybody's attention and we're not going to form their conscience. So they didn't make any big changes. What's next? They didn't, and it's important to note that what Bishop DiMarzio said, that was a sentiment issued by a number of bishops that got up and spoke. But in the end, what they voted to do was essentially they're going to reissue the document as is, and they're going to add an introductory insert to it that talks about Pope Francis's most recent teachings and policy changes that may have taken place in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they'll issue that before, ahead of the 2024 election, and then after the election, they said they're going to re-examine the document as a whole, and that's when we could see the potential for wholesale, wholesale changes to what we have before us in this document. All right, so that gives them a little time. Uh, this was exciting. Three American women are one step closer to sainthood after the bishops advance their causes. Some of them shared personal testimony this at this time, right? Yeah, and that it was it was one of the brightest spots of the entire conference because you know the the bishop of the diocese that's bringing forward the cause mm -hmm. goes up and they present the cause, and just naturally, you know, one person gets up and they say. This, this person meant so much to me becoming a priest, me taking this vocation. And it kind of got the ball rolling of, for each one of them, a number of bishops got up and spoke and talked about how important these three women were to their own priesthood and to the Catholic Church. Um, so it was just a beautiful thing and each one um, got a roaring, you know, not a roaring ovation, but they all got a big vocal approval. Mm -hmm. um, overwhelming majority wanted the, these causes to continue. Oh, that's really nice. And now, even though you're back, the conference continued today behind closed doors. Why do the bishops have private meetings? You know, it's something they, they really started doing last year with the, on Monday. They have that first day where they uh, meet together, they pray, they reflect, and that's where they talk about a lot of these things, meet in small dialogue, small groups, and that's where a lot of bishops you know, some of them told me a lot of them are more comfortable in that setting, mm. talking about issues and getting things done. So they have another day at the end this year um, to talk about those things in private. And I imagine they'll be doing a lot of the same um, in a synodal manner, if you will, as we're doing all around the country, you talking the, together. The round tables. Exactly, the round right? tables, mm -hmm. yep, sitting together and talking so in a way where they're facing each other to really get to the heart of what the, needs to be done to better move the forward the church in the U.S. To find out more about the sainthood causes of Mother Margaret Mary Healy Murphy, Cora Evans, and Michelle Dupong, go to thetablet.org. You can also read other articles on all the topics covered this week in Baltimore. She lost her son and gave her pain a purpose. Grief is the price we pay for love. The pages of a new book filled with a mother's love. Peggy Vergadama lost her son Michael to cancer five years ago, and along with losing her youngest son, she lost her faith. But it was restored as she moved through the stages of grief and wrote a book. Peggy compiled the letters she sent her son during the 23 days before he died in a book called Love Letters from a Mother to Her Dying Son. It was a heart-wrenching process, but as Jessica Easthope reports, it brought her closer to God. He used to go crazy because here's this lawyer, you know, and I said, oh, this is my baby, you know. So. Michael was the baby. I love you forever. Peggy's I'll youngest of four. As Her pride and joy. Your baby all day. They spoke every day, even when he moved down to Florida. They were more than mother and son. They were best friends. What a beautiful gift God gave us to be able to share in the creation and development of a child throughout his whole life. And... What greater gift could I have? Now, Michael and Peggy's relationship lives on through this book, Love Letters from a Mother to Her Dying Son. Peggy wrote letters when she couldn't be with Michael during his last days. He did not want us to watch him die. My pastor said to me, you know, think of Mary, you know, and with the Pieta, and I said, she got to hold her son. I didn't. On April 14th, 2017, Good Friday, Michael lost his battle with an aggressive form of throat cancer. My faith was shattered. I lost my son. I lost my baby. Peggy took her time to grieve before pouring her loss and love into her book. She published it on Amazon earlier this year with all of the proceeds going back to Cathedral Prep, Michael's alma mater. Cathedral's model is men for greatness. To me, Michael personified that title in every phase of his life. The book was on Amazon's bestseller list among new arrivals in the bereavement category the week of its release. If I can help one person get over this hurdle of, of feeling despair and distraught and, and, and lost, 
the book is, is well worthwhile. With her through her grieving and writing process was her pastor at Our Lady of the Miraculous Metal Church, Father Anthony Sansone. And we are all much richer for it. Father Sansone says the book has further inspired his own view on life after death. I really believe that he is present as well. And much of what has happened in the course of the past uh, year, you know, he has brought about. Peggy sought out to help others, right. but the book has allowed her to heal. I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, your mommy or baby. Island. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. So far, Peggy has sold 75 copies and has donated $150 to Cathedral. She only gets $2 for every paperback copy and $3 for every Kindle download, but she's hoping to have enough one day to give a scholarship in Michael's name. You can buy Peggy Vergadamo's book, Love Letters from a Mother to Her Dying Son, on paperback or Kindle on Amazon. Still to come on Currents News, donations for decorations. How a Brooklyn hospital is helping churches get ready for Christmas. And speaking of Christmas, go grab a pen and paper. When we come back, we'll give you those details again on how to donate to the Tablet's Bright Christmas campaign. It's almost the holiday season and the Diocese of Brooklyn is already decking the halls. More than three dozen churches seen twinkling here across Brooklyn and Queens are now ready to kick off Christmas. Thanks to Maimonides Medical Center in Borough Park. Every year, Maimonides donates money to help spread cheer, giving parishes the opportunity to purchase decorations like lights and trees as part of their celebration of light. The initiative started back in 1995 and has been burning bright ever since. Some of those parishes have already scheduled their lighting ceremonies to see the displays yourself, all made possible because of Maimonides' generosity. Just go to thetablet.org. We have the full list of churches right there waiting for you. And earlier in the newscast, we told you about the launch of the Tablet's Bright Christmas campaign. The program, which began making Christmas brighter for the less fortunate children of the diocese in the 1960s, needs your help. Just make a check out to the Bright Christmas Fund and mail it to Bright Christmas LB number 2118, P.O. Box 95000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the zip code 19195. Or you can make your donation online with PayPal or a credit card at thetablet.org slash Bright Christmas. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.